I messed up tonight I lost another fight I still messed up but I'll just start again I keep falling down I keep on hitting the ground I always get enough to see what's next Birds don't just fly They fall down and they get up Nobody learns without getting Hello once again, citizens of the internet, and welcome back to Zootopia Minute, the minute-by-minute podcast where we review everybody's favorite hit Disney film of 2016, Zootopia. And we are very excited today. It is our 50th minute. That's right, we've made it to the big 5-0. And we are very excited today because today we are joined by our very special guest, Alex Robinson. That's right, Alex Robinson. He is an award-winning comic book creator whose notable works include Box Office Poison, Tricked, and Too Cool to be Forgotten. And also, he is the host of the Ink Panthers, Godfather Minute, and Star Wars Minute, the inspiration for our very own show. We are very excited to have you. Hello there. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. And I guess to introduce us, I'm Chaco. Uh, I also am go by Alex. But since we have another Alex on this podcast, <laughs> you can't refer to me as Alex or else it'll be a little bit confusing. It's not the Alex podcast. Why don't I be Alex and you be the other Alex? How about that? <laughs> other Alex. <laughs> All right. No, I'm, he's proper Dave. I'm other Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I'm Simmel, as always. Happy to be here as well. And as I mentioned, this is going to be minute 50. We've made it half of 100 minutes, guys. This is exciting. So our time step is going to be from 50.00 to 50.59 today. That starts right as Fru Fru, Mr. Big's daughter here, says dance at the end of the sentence. Time for our dance. And it ends right as Nick is picking up this very tiny little wedding cake. And he says, hmm, just before he goes to eat it. So um, I have a question right off the bat. Alex, have you seen Zootopia? Well, you know, it's funny because well, when you first asked me to come on the program, I had not seen it. I was interested in seeing it, but for whatever reason, I just uh, kept being on the, you know, how Netflix is. You just keep flicking around trying to find the perfect thing. You yeah. watch anything. Uh, but anyway, so uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you guys inspired me and I actually sat down and watched um, most of the movie. I still have half an hour left, but recording time was coming up, so I had to stop. But uh, yeah, so I, I've, I've seen everything except the last half hour, thanks to you guys. Yeah, actually, we were actually hoping you didn't see it, so you watched this one minute out of context and just oh, no. <laughs> completely confused. <laughs> You've ruined everything. <laughs> Sorry, I'll pretend, I'll pretend I didn't watch the other bits just for the sake of the show. All right. Perfect. Well, in the meantime, uh, I guess we do want to apologize for uh, we had a little bit of an absence. We tried to re- We're trying to get back on the week by week schedule, but I was at my military academy reunion. But within that time, Utopia has celebrated its second anniversary. And um, yeah, the Oscars mm-hmm. happened. Zootopia released um, these fantastic posters once again, mimicking the uh, nominated films in funny fashion. They had parodies of Jumanji as Zoomanji, uh, one that said all the bunny in the world and Lady Herd, all with characters from the film on these posters. So that's kind of funny. And with other news, uh, Disney has now announced their new streaming platform. So all of you guys following us on Netflix, it's going to be removed from Netflix on March. March 20th. So shift over to the new Disney streaming platform. We're not sponsored by them, but we'll probably be using that for future minutes. And because of this, we think that they might have changed the file on the uh, current Netflix system. So the minute might be about 10 seconds off if you're trying to sync with us. But uh, hopefully we'll give you the correct, at least the correct dialogue so you know how to follow along with us for future minutes. Yep, exactly. We're not shifting up where our minutes are. This is our own little time zone here, just for us. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, I guess to get into it, we asked Alex if he's seen Zootopia, and since this is a very special uh, minute, it's the section of the Godfather references, and the fact that Alex Robinson also does the Godfather minute, it's also special that he's here to celebrate our 50th minute while talking about the Godfather. So, Mm -hmm. what did we miss? Because... Simo and I, we have not seen The Godfather, we hate to admit, but um, <laughs> so we were completely clueless and all of our references c- kind of come distilled from pop culture. 
Yeah, well, uh, the good news for you guys is that, you, first of all, you should see The Godfather. Second of all, there's not much that is, like, there's not much deep cuts stuff in here. Like, uh, the house, the basically all the setting is, like, The Godfather house and stuff like that. The chair's a little bigger in the real in the real <laughs> movie, but... Um, <laughs> Just a little. Yeah, and the first half hour of Godfather takes place at his daughter's wedding, and... Uh, the gimmick is that they can't. He can't. Uh, Sicilian cannot refuse any request made on his daughter's wedding day. So uh, ah, there we go. I see. So uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> part of it. And the the uh, what is he a shrew? He's a good. Uh, he mm-hmm. does, is that's uh, he's a very good Brando. Is that Maurice Lamarche doing the voice of the shrew? It is. It is. Okay. I was so excited when I found that out because I love Maurice Lamarche and I thought it was so appropriate considering. Uh, the, he's been the brain on Pinky and the Brain, so another rodent character for him. <laughs> yeah, and I think on Futurama he might have done a voice of like a Godfather robot or something. Now that now maybe that I think yeah, about well it. he was uh, he was hedonism bot on Futurama. Yeah. All right. So actually, is that really true? Do you do you actually know if that a Sicilian cannot refuse a request on his daughter's wedding? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's genetic. It's a genetic inability. <laughs> these kids. Yeah, I've never been to a Sicilian uh, woman getting married, who, or I could go ask the father. <laughs> but uh, over on the show, we've done all sorts of things. Like, what would you ask for if you, if you know, if you bumped into the Godfather and his daughter's wedding day and that kind of thing? Would you want to get into his debt by asking him a favor and so on? Right. Yeah. So it is interesting that we've been watching this, and the thing is, we recognize that it is recognizing the Godfather, despite neither of neither of us having actually seen that film and Mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing where we recognize references because they've been referenced by other media like i get the joke because something else made the joke so it's like a reference of a reference and there's probably several examples of of things like that happening it's kind of like um actually speaking of maurice lamarche he was on rob paulson's podcast talking tunes a while back uh it was sort of right after rob started that show actually um one of the first guests he had on and he was saying how a lot of celebrity impressions are kind of impressions of other people doing impressions of the celebrity like mm-hmm. the the example used because Maurice LaMarche does a great uh, William Shatner and he mm-hmm. was saying that every William Shatner impression is just an impression of someone else doing a William Shatner impression right because if you've ever heard an impression it's so exaggerated compared to the way that he actually speaks but you still hear like where that influence is coming from and so it's an interesting sort of feedback mechanism so similar to what we're getting with the references here I think yeah I think that's true I think uh like i feel that way kind of about um the first time i saw gone with the wind mm-hmm. i was like boy half of this movie is is simpsons clips you know what i mean is are things referred <laughs> yeah, to on the exactly. simpsons so it's like and citizen kane too they refer to that all the time on, on the simpsons so i could see if you don't know citizen kane but you'd know it at least from the simpsons but obviously a lot of people uh parody wow, that citizen one. kane stole this from the simpsons Jeez. <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh well well, um, okay, so this is a uh, kind of a fun minute um, because we get to see Mr. Big kind of do a one eighty in attitude. Before he was mm-hmm. ready to ice them, he was ready to like off these characters in a Disney film, and all of a sudden, uh, he's allowing uh, them to go free, and he's allowing uh, Judy to start kissing him. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> another way it's around, a, kind of. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's kind of a big change. Well, I guess once he realized, hey, um, you saved my daughter's life, I'm going to return this favor and pay it forward. I, I guess that's kind of true. My dad, when he was working with the Oakland PD, will tell me very, very similar stories where he'll let a random gang member off um, if he just commits mid like a small fence. And the time when he accidentally went down a, the wrong alley and there was like a gang waiting for him, the guy who recognized my dad's like, no, 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 he, he, he's fine. He let me, he, he got oh, me wow. off. So wow. yeah, I, I guess these things that do happen in real life, which is kind of strange. <laughs> you never know. It pays it to be pays to be nice to people sometimes. Sometimes. It does. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. So the first bit of uh, dialogue we get into with this minute, it was right as Fru-Fru comes in and says, oh, daddy, it's time for our dance. And as soon as she sees these polar bears, these giant polar bears holding Nick and Judy above the precipice of this icy pit below. Funny, actually, we kind of ended on a literal cliffhanger in that sense. <laughs> she says, daddy, what did we say? No icing anyone at my wedding in a very funny kind of New Jersey accent, which I cannot properly emulate. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Big responds, Oh, I have to, baby. Daddy has to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of what? What is it? Jersey Shore or whatever. Yeah. She looks like Snooky. I... She's like the Snooky of rodents. Yeah. She definitely has the hairstyle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like one third of her height is her hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
Um, I am surprised you recognize Judy that quick, but I guess there's not many bunny cops as we've seen in this movie. So it's like, wait, a rabbit and it's a police rabbit. It's got to be that one. Well, <laughs> it could be a performer. You know, we, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> that reference still. Oh, boy. Uh, Chaco had to point that out to me in the last minute. What Mr. Big may actually have been alluding to. They do these sort of subtle references in a movie that's meant for the family. It's, you know, it's the whole Animaniacs fingerprints. What? <laughs> yeah <laughs> same kind of thing there well i guess the best sort of cartoons work on a, like multiple levels you know like like the old oh, Warner yes. brother cartoons included yeah when you go back and you watch them when you're an adult and you're like whoa so much of that went over my head my goodness yeah. <laughs> the warner brothers cartoons are also a great example of pop cultural stuff living on even though oh yeah like the original things are like well the, you know they're constantly referring to radio shows that no one knows what they are anymore but like at the time would have been topical references to people but now we know them only as Warner Brothers lines. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, funny. Looney Tunes and stuff like that even set the tone for like, they've sort of introduced tropes and uh, different vernacular terms into the language that didn't exist before. They're like a modern Shakespeare in that sense. Like uh, the term <laughs> Nimrod as a disparaging term. Uh, mm-hmm. I believe that was started by Bugs Bunny referring to Elmer Fudd as Nimrod. And Nimrod, of course, was a legendary hunter in the Bible, hmm. um, just referring to him in that sense. And now it's sort of become synonymous with idiot. And I believe yeah. that's at least one's theory as to why that word now means that. So it's interesting how these things permeate our culture in that sense yeah that's funny yes well the minute continues mr big says i have to baby daddy has to ice him again nick again screaming no no wait and then suddenly the bride to be shrew fru fru is her name says wait wait notices she may recognize who judy is says she's the bunny that saved my life yesterday from the giant donuts (laughs) that was a good jersey accent yeah, that was better. It was a better attempt than the last one I made a few minutes ago, I suppose. Yes. Um, so since you have seen through this movie, you'll know what that is referencing when they're running through uh, Little Rodentia, the mm-hmm. tiny rodent village there. And we have that giant donut, obviously a reference to uh, Randy's Donuts in Los Angeles, which almost crushes her. So we have a little bit of continuity. There's a reason that character was featured early in the minute. <gasps> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so... I guess that's the only way to get off in this case, because, you know, if Fufu didn't show up at that right time and right moment, uh, these two characters would have been off and our podcast would be over. That's where the movie ends. <laughs> <laughs> Go home, everybody. That's the film. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's nice to see that, um, I guess Judy actually being a cop, being a hero pays off and actually ends up saving the both of them. But the, uh, the next scene where Judy leans down and starts, um, kissing, uh, Mr. Big on both sides of the cheek. The image of Nick in the background just looking all shocked is priceless. That's one of my favorite clips, um, one of my favorite expressions <laughs> that Nick has. And we've been saying all throughout this podcast, almost every single Nick expression in this movie is fantastic. <laughs> it really is. It's very expressive. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, he seems very uh, Chuck Jonesy to me the fox oh yeah Yeah. i see i love seeing the way that these call back to earlier examples of uh, anthropomorphic animation to me i've Mm -hmm. seen a lot of comparisons between this film and the the disney robin hood Hmm. i don't know just the the expression he has on his face when he has that kind of like smug smile seems like such a i don't know to me seems so chuck jones but yeah (laughs) i guess everyone has their uh flavors well it's it's perfect he's voiced by jason bateman (laughs) because (laughs) that's like the perfect actor for these roles because i'm watching uh, jason bateman on the ozarks on the netflix show and just seeing uh him act it's like that's nick wilde and nick (laughs) wilde is jason bateman so (laughs) <laughs> when I was looking at that show on Netflix, I read the synopsis and I saw it was Jason Bateman starring and like the synopsis of the whole show was something like to save his family, a man must retrieve money that's been stowed inside the walls of a cabin. And I'm like, dude, change the word cabin to banana stand and you have arrested development. <laughs> Totally. So uh, I guess uh, next scene is the uh, wedding scene. Uh, I guess we want to talk about the wedding scene. Yeah. Well, I I don't want to sort of skirt over some of this dialogue in this thing before we get okay. right into that scene. Um, we do see a repeat of some of the same dialogue that happened earlier, which I thought was kind of funny. Once Mr. Big realizes, oh, my daughter knows this bunny. We see she waves to Judy. Judy says, hi, I love your dress. And then Fru-Fru responds, aw, thank you. And like the exact same tone as she did at when she said that exact same 
same line earlier in the film. Like if you go compare them, it sounds exactly the same. It's like a perfect callback. <laughs> Very clear <laughs> parallel there. At which point Mr. Big is satisfied and says, uh, put them down. And then we have this, uh, this line here. You have done me a great service. I will help you find the other. I will take your kindness and pay it forward. And I disagree with you, Chaco, because Judy does not kiss him. He kisses Judy. Judy just lets her, like, tilts her head to either side there. But he has to do most of the work. Yes, true. But she's he's not sitting the one on his chair lips. still, and she has to lean forward and have <laughs> let this happen. Well, otherwise he'd have to like get out of his chair and like run to either side of her head. It'd be kind of awkward that way. <laughs> but true. it's just funny to me that Judy seems to know immediately what to do. All all Mr. Big really does is sort of spread his arms wide, and she's like, "Oh, I know exactly what this means. This is him going to give me a greeting now." Mm-hmm. It's kind of funny. And yes, then we get that look on Nick's face, which is just fantastic. Yeah. Alex, is that how yeah. they kiss on the Godfather? The uh... <laughs> Is that how they kiss Marlon Brando, I guess? (laughs) That's like a European thing in general, isn't it? Yeah, Europeans definitely go for the either side of the the kiss on the cheeks Mm -hmm. thing. So uh, I think it doesn't happen too often in The Godfather, but I think it does happen in that office scene that this is, uh, you know, homaging. Yes. Well, now as we move on to our next scene transition here, we see Fru-Fru's wedding. There's a big celebration going on. There's dancing. There's bright lights everywhere. Everyone's dressed up in little suits. All these different rodents here. And uh, as we zoom out of this wedding scene, this reception for the wedding, you see that this entire dance is taking place on a small circular table. And all these polar bear guards are standing around it, just sort of (laughs) staring down at them, (laughs) giving you a sense of the scale of it. It it goes back to that nice... uh, size comparison thing we were talking about in previous minutes where things that seem like such a big area for these small rodents are barely any sizes for these polar bears and just seeing the contrast between these two different species is just kind of mind-boggling to see how it works in the physics of this world um which which is is kind of fun because you get to see that most of the uh people dancing or most of the uh, animals dancing in this particular scene they're all different types of rodents you have some shrews i think i caught some field mice in there not sure i saw any rats because rats would be slightly bigger but it is uh interesting to show that it seems like the only people who are invited to this wedding reception are smaller critters i mean sense. that's probably most of their friends to be fair <laughs> well I'm, I'm sure if you're a mob if you're the daughter of a mob boss you would make friends with like tigers and lions probably yeah so i wonder if it's like if the wedding is arranged you know like an old okay. uh, old school traditional family type thing maybe it's like yeah. part of a deal with the mob like an agreement between different mob families going on here i think you're right that you, people would probably if only just because of the practicality of of a shrew hanging out with a tiger like what things could you do together that <laughs> you can build your friendship on like you can't go bowling you can't like this you know <laughs> Like j- j- the simple scale of existence would just be such a big hurdle that it would be really hard to become, you know, good friends with someone. Like they can't have them over to visit because their house is probably, you know, the size of a shoebox or whatever. <laughs> right. So. My house or yours? Uh, it's going to be your house again, dude. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I want to keep my roof. A, yeah. So is, is this wedding scene a reference to something that's in The Godfather, I'm guessing, it takes place on the day of the dollar's wedding? It, uh, it, well, yeah, as I mentioned, the movie does start off, the first half hour of the movie takes place at her wedding. And um, I was disappointed that the, the, the jokes were not very specific. Like, there is a scene where the photographer is taking a picture of, uh, of the wedding. And in The Godfather, there's a famous scene of them getting their wedding picture taken. And I was wondering, but when I pause it, it, does, it they didn't make the other mice look like Godfather characters. You know, they're not standing with other characters that look like the Godfather characters. So right. I was kind of, you I was always kind of disappointed wonder, in that. Yeah, how far they're going to go with the reference, how how much of an exact mirror image they're going to do of the movie. Yeah, there's, yeah. Not, there's not much that's... Other other than the the house and and the, that office, there's not really much that's that specific to to the uh, to the Godfather. So uh, mm-hmm. just but, enough for know. the audience to get mm-hmm. it. Yeah, like or you know or yeah. So I was hoping they would put some, like deep cuts in there that uh, you know real fans would notice. But uh, oh well, can't have everything. <laughs> I do think, yeah, it, that's, that's the problem with creating an original movie where you want the film to kind of stand alone, but you also want to throw in these nice little Easter eggs. It's like, yeah. how far do you go with these Easter eggs before it's like, all right, these are exactly these characters, but yeah. they're shrews and mice. And oh, it's just a slight hint or a slight reference. 
Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so something I want to bring up here, this is a theory that uh, me and Shaco had sort of developed, and maybe we'll get your take on it here. The first time we really saw a detailed glimpse at the life of the rodent population in Zootopia was back in uh, minute 30. I remember that number because it was the very first live episode we did at a convention that was back at Everfree Northwest last year. And it was the scene where they're running through Little Rodentia. There's that weasel who has absconded with the bag of what turned out to to be moldy onions, I believe, as Bogo proclaimed. And Judy was chasing him through Little Rodentia. And we noticed that the other cops that showed up there was like a rhino and someone else I don't remember. But they're obviously far too large to properly respond to any sort of police incident that would happen inside the walls of Little Rodentia. And so it occurred to us, would the mice population or would the rodent population need their own sort of police force? Or have they sort of been, have they sort of not had access to that kind of thing? Are they just sort of left alone by the police department and have to fend for themselves? In which case, maybe they have some sort of private security going on or some sort of special enforced uh, de facto police that's sort of funded some more protection. by the community. Yeah, yeah, paid protection, which is why um, I guess having a mob boss-like character in this world would make sense because if you don't have any small cops policing this area, then lots of other stuff can kind of sneak under the noses of the yeah. uh, higher-ups. Yeah, so in other words, we think it makes sense that the mob would be rodents in this case hmm. because of that specific issue that maybe the police can't fit into this town all they have is paid protection yeah i guess it's a chicken and the egg thing is it does the mob prosper there because there are no police or does the place prosper because the mob basically acts as the yeah. police hmm. yeah that's true Could yeah, have well been that was something that i guess you guys uh, probably have had to suspend a lot of your disbelief in in the world that that we're living in because oh yeah we obviously <laughs> if you start thinking about it you're like well what are the like what do the animals eat <laughs> You know, the, yeah. the, the, the flyings just eat like veggie burgers and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and like, where does everyone buy clothes and things? Yeah, well, the uh, the directors the, of the movie basically say that they actually eat the uh, bug burgers. So uh -huh. all the uh, protein in this world are insects. And we also haven't seen uh, anthropomorphic fish or birds yet. So there's also a theory that birds and fish could also sustain them. And I think we do have proof that fish is a form of protein in one of the Tundra Town scenes. We see them selling uh, frozen fish in one. Yeah. Stalls. yeah when i first saw that i was wondering if it if that was like a uh you know some weird uh like that was the first thing that made me th question what they eat by the fact that they were yeah. selling fish I was, they called attention to it i was like well wait a minute <laughs> fish don't or, or fish like you know like imprisoned and and i guess they, you know, they're not they're not uh, they're still animals in this world it's yeah. like a fish civil rights movement something <laughs> yeah. like that uh, they just missed right. the evolutionary bus i guess yeah you're alex you're definitely right about suspending disbelief because uh one of the running jokes simo and i have in previous minutes is is there a furry jesus in this movie like it was <laughs> jesus actually exists in the movie because we saw the polar bear do the uh sign of the cross previously <laughs> and we're like does religion somehow exist in this movie and if that's the case is there some type of lion or lamb jesus yeah. Yeah, like, lamb, uh, lamb would make sense. Yeah, that's what I see. I'm Team Lamb. I think a lamb see, makes the most sense. So, um, so actually, Simo and I, we aren't furries, but because we're doing a <laughs> podcast on uh, Zootopia, we had some overlapping of fans who followed mm -hmm. us end up coming from the furry fandom. So when I was curious about what the furries represent Jesus as, when I looked on the uh, furry uh, artist websites, he always pops up as a lion for some reason. Hmm. So it seems like in the furry community, Jesus I I is identified as a lion. I think it's the yeah. long hair and the beard. Yeah. Like it's such a natural thing to make someone like with a long hair and a beard a lion just because it's so... You it's know. convenient. Yeah, it's majestic looking, King of the Beasts. I guess Aslan is a lion, right? From And he's supposed to be Jesus. Yeah, yeah. and he is a direct Christ analogy there. So oh. there you go. But <laughs> in another Pixar, in another Disney film, uh, the Pixar movie Cars 2, there is a Pope car. <laughs> so that also means <laughs> Literal that in the Cars <laughs> universe, there has to be a Jesus Chrysler or something. No. Jesus Chrysler, <laughs> is that what you said? <laughs> no, I... I, I I, they didn't say his. They didn't say if there was a Jesus, but there's a Pope car, so there has to be a Jesus in this world. And if there's a Jesus, I'm assuming his name is Jesus Chrysler. <laughs> well, I thought oh, the uh, I thought the current theory was that these cars are in a post-human world. Right. It's like a post-apocalypse kind of thing. And the right. Cars so that would mean that over. Jesus would still be a human. I guess. It, uh, I guess depending on your theology, you could argue that God would want the cars saved too. Which in which case, I guess he would send down a car, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> 
Actually, hearing the people who worked on the Cars movie, they actually, one of them was working on this grim theory. I think he posted it uh, a few months ago. But he said while he was working on the Cars film, he actually thought that, yeah, this did take place in the post-apocalyptic future where all the humans were dead. But all the Cars took on the identity of their previous owner, the last right. owner, yeah. before this happened, which is a really grim theory when you think about it. Uh, yeah, to... well, it does explain, it does explain, uh, you know, it's a neat solution, a tidy solution, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, tune in for Cars Minute, coming <laughs> oh, up, guys, the new podcast. No, <laughs> oh, no. no. Not no the more. best performing Pixar movie series. Well, the first one was okay, but. Well, speaking of Pixar and going back to this minute, we have a scene of Nick being past this little plate of cake. Yes. And you see him trying to fumble and try to eat this cake. And actually, um, this is I found this out when I went to one of the panels at D23 Expo last year. John Lassender, who's the head of Pixar and head of Disney Animations, he actually was filmed trying to eat a tiny cake off a quarter with a tiny fork. And the animators <laughs> right. used this as a reference to animate Nick eating this tiny piece of cake, which I thought was actually fascinating. And if you look this up on YouTube or somewhere online, there's actually a scene of John Lassender trying to eat this tiny piece of cake off a quarter. <laughs> yeah, that was a good I want to find that. That's hilarious. Well, that is sort of the last thing that happens in this minute is Nick is handed that piece of cake, kind of looks at it, isn't sure quite what to do with it. He's got a tiny little fork in his hand for his tiny little piece of cake and he just sort of says hmm and that's where the minute ends so we'll have to find out i guess whether he succeeds in eating that cake in the next minute <laughs> all right <laughs> All right, so that'll do it for sort of the minute dialogue, but we've still got a little bit of time. Alex, I think Chaco mentioned to me that you live in the Northwest. Is that correct? That is correct. I live in Seattle myself, actually. Mm -hmm. um, were you at Emerald City Comic Con at all? I was not. I, I wish I was, but I didn't find out about it until like the day it was happening. So I'm, I'm very much out of the loop with oh, the, gotcha. the comic scene around here, but uh, I would have gone if I'd known about it. Alex, are you still with Top Shelf? Or? Uh, yeah, all my books have been with Top Shelf. I'm not I'm not currently under a contract, but uh, I'm, it's going to okay. take me a long time to finish my book. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. Yeah, we're just curious because a lot of our uh, similar, a lot of our friends in the community work for IDW, which I think has mm -hmm. um, hmm. recently taken over Top Shelf. And some of our friends actually have to schedule their own cons and at other cons, IDW specifically books booths for them and have them come and set up and whatnot. So is that the same for Top Shelf with you? Do they actually like kind of book these cons for you or do you have to kind of do the legwork and do it yourself? Uh, if they're exhibiting at the show, you know, they will set up a booth and sell, sell all sorts of books. And if you're a Top Shelf creator, you're welcome to, uh, you know, hang out at their table. Um, but you can also do it on your own if you either want to, you know, if you want just more space to yourself or or if it, top shelf's not going then yeah you're to, you're on your own in terms of uh getting table space and stuff so so right now you yeah we mentioned that you're a prolific comic artist and uh creator but <laughs> I, I, I think you're prolific. also you're also more known for your I think your podcast now. So right yeah. now do people know you more for your podcast or for your comics? Definitely I, I think the podcast. Um mm. Which makes sense. I mean, it's on five days a week and, you know, it's a currently active thing where I've, you know, I've published a book, I guess, three years ago now. So which is forever in uh, comics time. So, uh, yeah, I'm fine right. with that. So we have no idea how you do it because we are doing this podcast. We try to keep a schedule once a week and mm -hmm. <laughs> we have not even we have not always I mean, met that it's goal. It's hard when this is yeah. not like my main gig, you know, like I have a quote unquote a real job to do. <laughs> and Chaco, you've you spend a lot of time obviously vending at cons and that takes a lot of yeah. prep work and setup and stuff like that. We're actually impressed that you were able to do Star Wars Minute uh, five days a week plus your mm -hmm. other podcast that you do. Um <laughs> How do you manage to even do all that? Like, well, tips I'm, to us. <laughs> I'm in the fortunate position of not having to do any production on our shows. Uh, on, right. on God, Godfather Minute, my uh, brother does all the, you know, editing and all that kind of stuff. And with Star Wars That's Minute, me my, with this one. my co-host Pete does it. So for me, I just show up and crack wise and it's up to them to, you know, uh, <laughs> it's up to them to do more of the hard work. So, uh yeah. So but with Godfather Minute, we only do it once a week because my brother is very busy. And so we, sure. we didn't want to have to fall behind or anything. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Same for me. I have similar to all the uh, audio work. So it seems like we Alex's <laughs> don't have to edit these podcasts. Oh, I see how it yeah. is. Nice work. If you can Alex get it. privilege. <laughs>
<laughs> well, as we said earlier, we uh, we were inspired by your show, Star Wars Minute, uh, which popularized the minute-by-minute format. But I think uh, you guys mentioned in one of your uh, previous episodes that you guys actually weren't the first to do the minute-by-minute format. Uh, do you know which movie that was? Well, there was a uh, a one about the Big Lebowski called Gutterballs. Which I think okay. is still um, is still running, mm-hmm. and they did they did come up with the idea first. We did not know they had done it when we started our show. Yeah, right. But we're all, we always give them credit whenever it comes up as as the. I think we were definitely the ones first. who popularized it because certainly after yeah. we mm-hmm. did it, there was a, there was you know a, a big ripple through the <laughs> podcasting I mean, community. Definitely, the minute by minute family was really created by you guys. You guys were the one who popularized that kind of format mm-hmm. if, if not started it because like it was two independent ideas right, i guess yeah. but what how did you and pete kind of come up with that uh, idea just curious uh well i think it was largely pete's idea again the, the alexes do very little work on these shows um <laughs> <laughs> because uh pete had been listening to a star trek podcast that basically every episode mm. they talked about a different episode of star trek and since we had done he had been a, a guest on uh, the Ink panthers a few times and we just literally talked about star wars for hours uh he was like well how can we do that with star wars that's if it's gonna last more than six episodes you know if you just do one movie right. per episode that's a pretty short run so then he said well what if we break it down by minute and uh, the people he told it to said that's a crazy idea you should totally do it so uh yeah <laughs> and it started a pretty good trend because right before i uh you guys started star wars minute the only podcast i was listening to when i draw is uh i fanboy and then ink panthers mm-hmm. and i actually found you guys through i fanboy but ink mm-hmm. panthers quickly became my favorite podcast cool um which i hope you guys you and uh mike dawson i hope you guys somehow continue it because i i do love whenever you do like uh, just a random spectacular uh <laughs> episode in the middle of summer after not posting for a year (laughs) but um yeah um because all these minute by minute shows are fantastic to listen to while drawing but what's interesting is within the community it seems like most of the uh, people who do the minute by minute shows are covering much older movies and Simo and I were covering a relatively new movie that just celebrated its two-year anniversary so Mm -hmm. well it seems like you guys have time to kind of see how culture has changed around like Mm -hmm. Star Wars or Godfather and whatever we're basically we started this I think podcast within a year of Zootopia coming out and it's like we're seeing everything as it's going instead of a more retrospective look as the other minute by minute podcast I would say so yeah we're uh, we're kind of facing that problem because next year we're supposed to start the Force Awakens minute which of Ooh. course only came out uh, I don't even remember now <laughs> Wait, are, are so you guys gonna, of them. <laughs> are you gonna skip Rogue One no, we're gonna we're going in release order, so uh, we'll do oh, Force okay. Awakens and then Rogue go. One and then The Last Jedi. So uh, yeah, so this is now we're much closer to when the movie actually came out, and you know we're starting this trilogy before we know how the trilogy ends. So that'll be a weird, you know, Ooh, we'll just be a lot of speculation point, huh? on our part. But uh, okay, we're, we're, we're okay, curious. How how do you think of The uh, Last Jedi then? <laughs> um, the first time I saw it, I was very uh, mixed. Uh, I think it was just a lot to unpack and, you know, when you're going in with your expectations and stuff. Uh, The second time I saw it, I liked it a lot more. Um, Not enough to go out and see it a third time, though. So I'm curious to see it on video um, because I think there are some scenes I really loved in it and that are like, you know, among the best things Star Wars has done. And then there was other elements that I was not, uh, not basically loved all the Luke, Rey, Kylo, Snoke stuff. And yeah. yeah. uh, that was the stuff I really liked, and the rest of the stuff was kind of hit or miss for me. I mean, there I would say that that movie had specific scenes I know I came back to watch. Like, right. there were specific moments, and of course, that big, impactful moment is, at, is actually uh, my wallpaper on my laptop right now because it's just a beautifully crafted scene. I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen the movie. Are you talking but... about when he drinks the milk? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's when something gets sliced. <laughs> That's okay. all I'm going to say. Um, so, yeah. Um, the movie's it's, it's on actually... video now. There's no reason people should yeah, not I, have I seen it Yeah, I think we're safe now. there. <laughs> I mean, for me, Snoke, Snoke is interesting because, I don't he just seems to me like the generically evil villain. Like the... Mm-hmm the 90s Saturday morning cartoon villain type character where you're not really sure what his deal is. We still don't really know much about his backstory. I mean, some people really like him, some don't. You could say the reviews are split on Snoke. (laughs) 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 Oh, well. But yeah, it's it's actually fun to uh, especially hear your guys' reaction um, when I started following you guys with the New Hope 
um, because my um, I grew up in kind of a Star Wars family. I, I'm not really a Star Wars fan myself, but my mom and dad, my dad specifically used to be friends with Lucas um, when he was working on the original film. Wow. And actually, my mom and dad are the ones who invented that lightsaber toy. Um, they actually own the patent to it, which is kind of interesting because I, I grew <sighs> up with so all cool. these lightsabers around Wait, my house. Which lightsaber toy? The, the, the collapsible lightsaber that's at all the raves now and parades and Disneyland oh, okay. and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, that's cool that my dad actually invented that um, when he was in the <laughs> a pilot in the Marine Corps. But since he was also friends with Lucas and he saw he was helping with the original film, he's like, yeah, it's kind of like the lightsabers you guys have and patented it. But apparently, I guess they had their differences because my dad does not talk about Lucas anymore, despite mm. still loving the uh, Star Wars films, which is <laughs> wow. kind of a weird situation for me growing up. So you're the heir to the laser sword fortune, which mm. I, I wish I made money off that. <laughs> I see these for sale almost everywhere, and I don't yeah, think my family has made any revenue. Yeah. Your dad's well, got to get out and enforce that patent. You know these things, especially with trying to sue Lucas and Disney? They have all these money. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, so oh, so you, are you saying that they stole it from your dad? Well, well, the patent is still under my parents' name, but I don't think they renewed the patent, but they were selling they were selling that specific uh, item without, um, without paying any uh, royalties or anything. Wow. Which I guess is they would my parents would have either had to enforce it or Sue. Yeah, and Sue. of course at that time they were poor and they couldn't do it. But it's strange because I, I grew up so I grew up in a Taoist family and Star Wars has a lot of oh yeah points that kind of reference Taoism. So I keep on joke I keep on joking to most of my friends who kinda of grew up in Christian families and grew up with veggie tales. Star Wars is kinda of like my veggie tales. <laughs> um, so very, very different, but <laughs> Yeah. Served an analogous function in your childhood. Which is why I love hearing how uh, you guys approach Star Wars, because it's a totally different environment than my situation growing up with Star Wars, where it's had like this connection with my family and my religious upbringing. And for you guys, it's like just a childhood movie that you saw and now it's like this big nerd cultural phenomenon but that's really um, interesting cultural phenomenon before i was born yeah <laughs> but... well that's the thing uh, simo and i we still really like zootopia but i think watching it after 50 minutes uh we've kind of grown a bit uh tired as much as we still like the film um but alex uh, have you kind of felt the same way with star wars as you're are you still like an active fan or has doing the podcast kind of drained you of all your star wars hype and stuff i wouldn't say it's drained me of it but but it's definitely it's it's definitely different being a professional fan than being just right. Like I'd probably spend way more time thinking about Star Wars than I would. Well, I definitely spend more time thinking about Star Wars than I would <laughs> if I was not doing the show. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I have to not only see everything, but I have to have opinions and be able to talk yeah, about it. And that's an obligation. Then. So people will um, look to you as sort of a, an authority in a sense. Yeah, well, there are times. You know, it's like anything. You know, you get kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of sick of talking about Star Wars. Like Pete and I, when we're together, uh, we never talk about Star Wars when we're not on the show. <laughs> you know what I mean? When, <laughs> if we start talking about Star Wars, we stop ourselves and say, okay, we can't talk about Star Wars because it's just, you know, we need a, we need a break <laughs> from it sometimes. Oh so uh, we talk about Land of the Lost instead. <laughs> That's there funny. Has uh, doing the podcast actually got you invited to like Star Wars conventions or whatnot uh, well we've made some friends with other podcasters and stuff and that's been really cool especially like comedy podcasts but in terms of like official star mm -hmm. wars recognition we're still we're still really like we've never made official contact like with anyone who works directly for lucas or or you know anything like that so uh that still has yet to happen so uh but yeah we went to the star wars celebration convention and things like that but nice that was do a lot you, of fun. uh do you go go to cons a lot are you a con goer kind of person or um I used to do a lot of cons uh, when I was younger because, you know, when I was uh, focusing a lot more on my comics career. But uh, as I've gotten older and comics conventions have become more and more about not the kind of stuff that I do. You know, my stuff is, sure. you know, little black and white comics about people talking about their feelings and stuff. And, you know, you go to uh, most conventions and it's about video games and superhero movies and toys yeah, and things like that. that has nothing to do now. with generic pop culture. Yeah. People don't go there to buy comics. They go there to, you know, get free stuff from Marvel and DC and 20th Century <laughs> Fox. So uh, that's actually something I would have to say about Emerald City Comic Con, which I went to between now and the last minute, actually, because we had a little bit of a break there. Um, the first year I went to that con was like 2012, and it was mm -hmm. like a fairly large convention, but it had a very sort of community oriented feel. It was a lot of panels run by just regular attendees. 
And now Emerald City Comic Con just in the past, you know, five years has kind of exploded exponentially. Now it's, I believe, like the third or fourth largest Comic Con in North America, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just completely shifted to like a big sort of industry trade show type deal where to the point where I don't even necessarily feel like it's worth going the whole weekend anymore. I used to go all three days. Now I I just went one day this time. It just doesn't quite feel the same, especially for uh, me and Chaco, who, I mean, the way we met, we actually, we've been involved in the the My Little Pony fan community. That's kind of how we met and how we got started there. And when mm-hmm. you go from that, where every convention, you know, the biggest convention of that that there is, is only, uh, you know, it capped at 10,000. Now, BronyCon's smaller than that. Most cons are something like, you know, 3,000, 2,000 or less. It's just a very different feel uh, between those types of events. And it makes you wonder, like, how, how fandom is evolving, how fandom is becoming sort of a more accepted thing in our, I guess, national global culture. I mean, nerd used to actually be an insult. It's not anymore. Yeah. That kind of thing has changed. So it's just interesting yeah. to see that kind of change occur. I guess the big difference is probably now that uh, companies realize how much money there is in catering to nerddom. <laughs> you oh, know? yeah. So that's why they're <laughs> like, before they didn't, you know, there was like eh, a bunch of people selling used comics in a, in a gym somewhere. Who cares? But uh, <laughs> now that they can use it as a, like a marketing tool and, and uh, things like that, it's... Uh, I still enjoy going to uh, one reaction to the to the sort of giantification of comic shows is that or conventions is that like small press shows have started springing up a lot more which Mm. and those are you know each a lot of cities seem to have their own kind of little you know uh, alternative comics convention and those are a lot more fun to do and more like the audience that I'm that you know more casual actually that's where I, that's the where i think where i met uh your uh, co-host for ink panthers mike dawson i oh, think yeah. i met him at the uh, small press expo that makes and sense. it was completely night and day uh so baltimore comic-con happened i think a month before and then going to small press expo in the same area it's such a smaller environment it's like kind of just one room and it's just more casual at baltimore comic-con remember uh chris saros uh the editor for top show he was completely swamped uh and at small press expo I was able to chat with him a lot more show him some like uh, comic ideas and it was a much more friendly casual environment uh, especially seeing a mix of pros in the established comic book industry and also seeing like local art students um, up and coming art students trying to create their own little zines and comics yeah and it's also a lot more affordable than uh, exhibiting it like the San Diego Comic Con you're paying like three thousand dollars four thousand you know thousands of dollars for a booth you go to small press expo you spend two hundred dollars you have a table for the weekend and you at least have more of a chance of making your money back whereas san diego you know that's just you'll no one can sell enough comics to to <laughs> pay for a san diego trip oh, oh yeah i um the most i think i've paid for a booth myself is in the a thousand range but yeah mm-hmm. I, it's, it's it's nicer to go to a smaller con where it's only like a hundred or two hundred for a table and yeah yeah I, i'm actually i might be vending at san diego this year but yeah you're right the prices they're just oh insane <sighs> good and, luck yeah yeah. So I think before we wrap up, so we always ask our guests um, before we go, because I draw the uh, title cards for each of the um, oh, episodes. Yeah. We, we ask them, what animal do they want to be represented as? But I kind of already predetermined what animal you would be because you're the host of the Ink Panthers podcast. I already have in my mind that I'm going to draw you as a panther. But I guess if I didn't have to <laughs> prejudge you, what animal do you think you would? Yeah. What's your zoo sona? Identify you. Yeah, what's your Zusona? That's our joke. What's our Zusona? <laughs> um, I, well, first of all, you should totally do me as a panther because that's way cooler okay. than anything I'm going to come up with to describe <laughs> Way myself, cooler than so. what I was going to say. Yeah, I guess the, the lazy answer would, like the most obvious one would be some kind of bear because I'm a, you know, heavy set guy, heavy set furry guy. So that seems like the, the who enjoys eating honey. So uh, so that would probably be the easiest, the <laughs> Literal easiest Winnie answer the Pooh. to do. But uh, yeah, although I, I wear pants when I'm in mixed company, though, unlike Mr. Pooh. I'm like Mr. The Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Speaking of that film, apparently they're rebooting Wayne the Pooh. So it's just Disney for you. Because everything's getting a reboot. Even Reboot, the beloved Canadian show, cartoon. <laughs> I have yeah. not heard of that. <laughs> oh right. my gosh, you guys. Uh, all right. A little off topic, maybe. Well, it was called Rebout down here. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm the first person to make that joke. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that must have been prepared in advance. I don't believe that that could have been an on-the-spot show. Just... Very well done, sir. I can't believe um, I'm, yeah, I'm the first person who said that. That's Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, 
Well, Alex, we just want to thank you so much for joining us on this minute. Before we do go, we want to give you a chance just to sort of plug some of your own stuff that you may got going on. Yeah, I, uh, as we mentioned, I'm on the uh, Godfather Minute, which you can find at godfatherminute.com. It's uh, me and my brother. We uh, watch a minute of The Godfather and talk about it. And then, of course, Star Wars Minute, which I co-host with Pete the Retailer, and that's on five days a week at starwarsminute.com or at find wherever you find podcasts. And I'm also a cartoonist. Uh, you can check out my stuff at comicbookalex.com. Thank you. Darn, he was the one who, you're the one who took Comic Book Alex. I want Comic Book Alex. (laughs) (laughs) Gotta be quick on there, on the internet like that. I'll sell it to you. (laughs) All right, well, thank you very much for joining us, Alex Robinson. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. All right, guys, so that is going to be it for this episode of Zootopia Minute. Thank you so much for joining us for our 50th minute. Only got about 58 left to go. So if you did enjoy the podcast, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter at Zootopia Minute, like us on Facebook, and you can also send us anything you want, your thoughts about the show, about the guests we've had, anything we've talked about here, anything you want us to know. You can send that to our inbox at Zootopia Minute at gmail.com all right guys so that is going to be it until next time hope you have a wonderful week bye everybody bye